we had to talk about an integrated society as opposed to a segregated society. And what I would caution everybody, including my people, that where I come from in Minnesota, and my Indian friends uh, and brothers and sisters all over the country, that's tempting in the short run to talk about separateness. But in the long run, it's going to, it would be a devastating public policy to revert back to the separateness that we once had. We hear talk about having separate Indian schools. We hear talk about black separate schools. We're beginning to hear talk about Hispanic separate schools. We're even ta hearing from time to time about having girl, uh, gender, the en gender comes into this, separate schools for girls again. One can't argue that you can't learn in those environments because you can. It's a question of what, how you're going to survive economically over time. That's the real issue. There's some psychological comfort to being separate to be with your own. But when you have a population like American Indians do, and you see the budget crunches as they hit, how do you suppose those schools would face, would fare? In the economy where everybody wants part of that action. About three years ago, we had a very, very dedicated state senator from Minnesota that was carrying some legislation that wanted to create a separate Indian school in Minneapolis. The question of learning was not an issue. The question of psychological comfort wasn't an issue. Uh, the question of control might have been a partial issue. But the real question was, what happens over time to the financial support of that kind of institution and what we have learned from Board of, uh, Brown versus Board of Education and countless other experiences like that, that the economy shift and those people who, are, who do not have the power through the ballot box are the first ones to receive or to experience that kind of setback. So I, I caution I cautioned, um, our people in Minnesota about that, and they disagree with me. And said, you know, we've, uh, we can't make it in the public schools, we've got to get our own school. And I said, well, that's great, just make sure you have lots of money that can endure, you can endure for not only this decade, but the next decade as well because over that period of time you're going to experience some ups and downs and pretty soon you're going to be taking things what the public school doesn't want. You'll be getting the worst facilities, you'll be getting the worst uh, uh, curriculum materials and because the people know the value of public education in this state and they're going to be on the doorstep of their superintendent and their school boards and they want that action and they'll get it. That's one of the concerns that, that I see emerging on this separateness. Um, and it concerns me a little bit that, uh, that we may be pausing to think too seriously about it and not spend enough time on thinking of some alternatives so that we can have the best of both. If we can have that, if we need that psychological comfort we have to build it into the system somehow during a, for a portion of the day so that you don't jeopardize the long-term economic status of that building or that school system. And uh, that is not an easy uh, one to, to, to sell at the time because we have, we have some uh, school or two communities right now that are thinking about a class action suit against a public school and creating their own uh, school system. Uh, I, I'm a little nervous about that kind of movement because I, I don't believe that they'll get that support that they need. 
Am I still optimistic? Indeed, I'm very, very optimistic. Some people say, Will, you've always been an idealist about, about this. You, you, you just are not, you're not thinking about the realities. Um, but I think of, uh, of a statement that Harlan Cleveland made. Let me read it to you. Uh, because it, it makes a lot of sense for leadership. And I quote, If you try too carefully to plan your life, the danger is that you will succeed. <laughs> succeed in narrowing your options, closing off avenues of, of adventure that cannot now be imagined. End of the quote. And I think that if we somehow can instill that sense in, in, in our people, whether they be people going through the schools, whether they be our tribal leader, that we won't close off those avenues, even though we have a little success. That we can do more with imagination and vision if we keep those options open. 20 years from now, maybe I'll come back and you'll uh, Will someone have been born on this day and can tell me that I'm an elder and, uh, and I can enjoy an evening like I have uh, this evening? It, it just talking about it sort of inspires me again. Uh, I haven't been as close to it as I have over the last uh, uh, 10 years, but I, I know that Henrietta and her colleagues like herself and, and uh, people that have worked so hard in this area, it's just, it, it, they must feel pretty good because in spite of the fact that we, had, we have some setbacks, those people have taken, their, taken some risk and, um, and I think they've made life better for their people. I'm delighted again to have been here with the Thompsons and uh, thank you all for a very, very warm reception for Mary Lou and I and I look forward to seeing many of you over the next several hours while I'm in Ames, Iowa. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.